Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm Eric Cohen, the executive director of the Tikva Fund, and it's really a privilege to welcome you to the latest of my conversations with three of the people that have certainly shaped Tikva in the most profound ways, but who have also had a large influence on Jewish life, American life, and the life of the state of Israel through their ideas, their philanthropy, and their leadership in the political arena. If you missed it, I think my conversations with Roger Hertog and Elliot Abrams were really fascinating, interesting, and insightful, and I encourage you to watch the videos which are available on our website. And tonight, I would say we'll save the best for last, but <laughs> you're all the best in my view. Um, I have the great privilege to sit down with Professor Ruth Weiss, a long time a distinguished senior fellow here at Tikva, and truly a teacher to many of us. Now, Ruth, you and I have sat down, if I had to guess, 30 or 40 times for really? conversation. Okay. Um, but it's almost always around a story or a thinker or a poem. And selfishly for me, preparing those conversations has been sort of my mini graduate school in Jewish literature and culture. Uh, but tonight we're going to do something a little different because the text in a way is you. Um, in a way, we'll get a preview of your wonderful memoir, which began as a series of essays and mosaic with the provocative title Free as a Jew uh, that will be out in September. Uh, I'm sure all of you know Ruth Weiss by now, uh, if you're part of the Tikva community. But to me, what's remarkable about Ruth is she is the trifecta. She's certainly one of the great scholars of modern Jewish, Yiddish, Hebrew literature. She's also a remarkable teacher of young people at McGill and then Harvard and now here at Tikva. But she's also a courageous and important Jewish public intellectual. Uh, and for all those reasons, Ruth, we're thrilled to have you here. Thanks. We're thrilled for everything you've contributed to Tikva over the years. Uh, and personally, it's been a great privilege to learn from you and be your friend and colleague. So I thank you. So uh... these, these discussions are meant to be a little more personal and biographical. And I thought we'd start with your parents. Um, yours is a remarkable story um, of building a life, first in Montreal and then in the United States. And I wonder if you'd be willing to say a little bit about your mother and your father, what drove them, uh, and the world that they shaped for you as a young Jew. Well, <clears throat> it's a daunting task um, in many ways. Firstly, I want to say that just being here after Roger and Elliot is, um, is really quite a challenge because I agree those discussions were wonderful. And uh, Tick was the place where I'd feel most at home um, in discussing almost every question. And certainly thinking about my parents in this context, you know, I tend to think of myself as a very independent person. And I kind of grew up without parents because it was in an immigrant family. And my parents, frankly, did not have any time for me. So um, it was a great bonus. <laughs> it means that you're really on your own. No one's watching over you. So I always thought of myself as really, yeah, you know, I sort of formed my own way. But thinking about it for tonight, uh, somehow I realized the degree to which I am actually uh, a product of uh, their thinking um, and their being in a certain way. And he here's what I mean. You see, my parents, in a sense, gave birth to me twice or, or gave me life twice. Of course, they gave me life in the way that parents normally do. But they also took us out of Europe. Now, my father uh, had been a penniless engineer when he was entrusted with building a rubber factory in Chernovitz in northern Romania. And he did that. And my mother came with him there from Poland, two Yiddish-speaking youngsters. They were in their late 20s. And um, they became wealthy because to build a factory and to be a factory owner, one day you're sleeping on straw as a student, and the next day you, you, know, you have a chauffeur uh, and so forth. So they became very prominent and, and wealthy in this community of Jews in Romania, and my father running this factory, which actually he has a medal from the king of Romania for having done that. So they were living very well for the first time in their lives. And um, they were part of a circle, a Zionist circle called Masada. And, um, and they had these two children, my older brother and myself. And then my father, though, uh, realized 
that the world was not a safe place, especially after 1939, after the invasion of uh, Poland. My father figured that if the Soviets and the Nazis had carved up Poland between them, it wasn't going to be long before Russia, the Soviet Union, was going to march on Romania as well. So he started putting everything into play, and he spoke to others about leaving. And on the day that the Russians crossed the northern border, a phone call came to my parents' house. My mother was there, and they said, leave. And my mother, within a couple of hours, packed up what was left, took us on the train, took us to uh, Bucharest, where my father was already there trying to get papers ready. And that was it. We never came back. There was no question of ever going back. Now, that is very unusual, may I say, really unusual. Uh, people to have been so settled, happy, uh, comfortable in every sense, but my father looking at the world quite realistically and knowing that it was going to be time, it was very likely that it would be time to flee, not just to leave, but to flee. And so they did. And, um, and you know, it took us a couple of months to go th down to Athens, and there was difficulty with papers, and there was certainly difficult with the consulate in Portugal, in Lisbon, when we got there. And the ship that we crossed on and came to Canada on, I had thought was torpedoed during the war. It turned out that it was not torpedoed, actually, but it was taken out of commission. And it was then made into a, um, a, a war vessel f serving, um, the, the, serving the war, not, not serving as a passenger uh, ship any longer. So that, in brief, is how I got to Canada. And I was four years old and um, ready for this in a strange way uh, because my mother had had a lost a child before I was born, two years earlier, a very beautiful little girl, and um, she got sick, and of course at that time there were no antibiotics, and she died. And I think that this totally, um, you know, un unnerved my mother. So when I was born, I had a governess, um, a Jewish governess, but German-speaking. So this governess raised me. So for four years, I spoke only German. My parents didn't speak German, they spoke Yiddish. My brother was studying in Romanian, but I spoke this beautiful German with my governess, and my mother likes to tell these stories of how heads would turn, you know, in the street when we were walking and I was babbling away to her and so forth. Um, so when we left, you see, um, apparently they would put me in front when we came to a border crossing or to anything. And there I was, you know, speaking German, you know, as we crossed Europe. What better language could one have to make one's way across Europe at that time? But I had nothing to do with this. I mean, if it weren't for them and if it weren't for their perspicacity and if it weren't for their really their genius and their nerve, you know, the nerve to leave everything, the nerve to know that life, in a sense, was more important than comfort. So that's the leaving part. And the political realism that um, means so much to me. I, um, I really think that in politics, it is so important not necessarily to think the worst, but to really think in terms of worst case scenario. Uh, to be as realistic as one can possibly be and to see the broader picture. So that's the leaving. That's the leaving. What about the building? What is it that they built, this new life in Montreal, and how did that shape your Jewish attachments, your Jewish identity, your Jewish outlook, or just your outlook in general? Well, you see, this is the other remarkable part of the story. Um, so what they left was one thing. When they came to Montreal, my father's brothers were running a factory. They had found, uh, they had wanted to live in the 
nicest part of Montreal that they could possibly live in. And that's where they rented us a place, too, when we came. And they were there. And my father was working in this factory that the four brothers were running together. My mother, within a year, said, nothing doing. So she moved us across the city to Outremont. This was Westmount, where they were. And she moved us to Outremont. Now, Outremont was not all very poor, but it was where the immigrant area was. And all the Jewish institutions, the Yiddish-speaking Jewish institutions, were in that area. So she just picked us up, moved what us What was there. she looking for in that room? This is interesting. She was not looking... Uh, <laughs> to go from wealth to poverty, although I always joke and say we are the only downwardly mobile family that I ever knew, you know, who moved from Westmount to this, to Outremont area. But what she was looking for, um, it's hard for me to reconstruct exactly, but obviously she was looking for a Yiddish milieu, a, um, a place where there were Jewish schools, that she could send us to Jewish day schools. There was a Jewish public library in that area. Um, there were people that she wanted to be among. She wanted to be in, a, uh, in an area that was as much like her native city of Vilna as she could possibly reconstruct. And here's the interesting thing. My mother knew six languages very well. She spoke French quite fluently. She could have picked up English in a heartbeat. Um, and as I say, in Chernovitz, she had me raised in German because I was supposed to fit into high society. My brother was learning Romanian, the language of the land. But from the time that she moved us there and came to Montreal, my mother ran the house and spoke Yiddish. She, she spoke a beautiful Yiddish but she spoke Yiddish exclusively. Now, when I say exclusively, you understand, my mother would never mix languages. So if we were speaking Yiddish, she didn't want us to use other words in it. And also, when one was speaking English, she didn't want us to use Yiddish words in English. A language to her had to be self-contained. She had a bit of a kind of intellectual snobbery, I would almost say, about a kind of a sense of aesthetic perfection. Um, so there we were in this area where she felt as much at home as she could possibly have felt. And Yiddish, I think, became for her what Jewish observance was in many other families. Because there were families that came that kept their observance. My parents had not been observant. My mother was left orphaned when she was 19. My father had left home. So, you know, she didn't keep a kosher home. I think, you know, she, she had not lived in a kosher home for years. And certainly in Chernovitz, they didn't have one. Um, and my father joined a synagogue because he had to say Kaddish, you know, for the family, things like that. But we were not, it was not an observant home. But, but it was observant in the sense that one had a sense of cultural sanctity. And that cultural sanctity really had to do not just with the Yiddish language, but with sustaining Yiddish newspapers, um, Yiddish publications and books, and staying in touch with whatever was happening in Europe. Because our lives really were very much in Montreal. But the truth is that when I recreate my childhood, in a sense, my brother had a shortwave radio. So he was really listening to the radio all the time. Well, I was not. But if I think of myself in those days and of our whole family, I would think of us as sort of having an ear cocked to what's happening, what's happening over there. Now, what my mother learned during the course of the next years was that one after the other, her brothers and sisters were all killed. My father's father, was killed in the Bialystok ghetto with his sister and their whole family. So it was five years of just learning from various sources about death, death, death. None of that was very palpable to me, except a little bit atmospherically. You knew 
that you couldn't afford to make any mistakes. That's what, you know, um, school, you were going to be a troublemaker? Forget about it. <laughs> you, know? you, had, you just had to behave, whatever, whatever that meant, which wasn't all that difficult for me because, you see, this is also very interesting. The environment that I was raised in was so close to what my home was like that, it was like going to Jewish day school that my parents sent me to, the Yiddish Volksschule, was as much like home as it could possibly be. The teachers were the friends of my parents. Uh, the languages there were the same languages that was being spoken at home because some of the classes were in Yiddish. Um, the feeling of the school, the idea of being a Jew, it was... What was the Jewish curriculum of the school? Well, the Jewish curriculum of the school was... Um, Yiddish language and stories and literature, depending on which grade you were in. But by grade seven, we were reading Sholem Aleichem and Peretz stories. Uh, we were reading uh, some Yiddish poetry. Um, and also we read Bible in Hebrew. So we didn't really study the Hebrew language, but we started to study Chumash in Hebrew, just the beginnings of the book of Genesis. Um, so that was part of the curriculum. And Jewish history. The school was very... Uh, we had a teacher who was an excellent historian, and um, not that he'd studied history formally, but he uh, studied Midrash <laughs> formally, and he loved history. He loved telling us historic, history st uh, stories. So that was the curriculum. But hear this... There were four uh, valedictorians when we graduated in grade seven, each of the four languages, because ideally we were expected to know English, French, Yiddish, and Hebrew. That was the ideal of the school. Um, we did learn French, and of course, we, most of the English curriculum, the math and the reading and all that was in English. So it was quite ambitious and... Um, and it, you know, it would have been hard for me to answer your question because I don't think we thought of it as English and Jewish separate. You see, I don't think we thought of it that way. We thought of it as everything was Jewish and English. I mean, the languages were different. But, um, and the day was divided into English studies and Jewish studies but it did not ever feel divided to me at all. So your life was influenced by uh, and intersected with three of the most significant Jewish intellectual figures of the modern era. That's true. And I just thought we could talk about each of them for a few minutes. So the first is Abraham Sutzkever. So who was this? Why was he such an important figure in Jewish life, oh. Jewish cultural life? And what was his influence on you? Well, uh, as I've explained my home and school, and uh, incidentally, uh, when I went to Protestant high school, I continued to go to afternoon classes in Jewish day school. So y Yiddish literature and culture was part of our home, and uh, the names of Yiddish writers were uh, known to me, and my parents were friendly with the Yiddish poets who lived in Montreal. So when my husband and I were married um, in 1957, the, day, the year that I graduated from uh, college and that he graduated from law school, we went to Israel for the summer, for the whole summer. And um, the Yiddish poet Melech Ravitch, who was a friend of my parents in Montreal, said to me, um, listen, when you're in Israel, in Tel Aviv, you've got to meet Sutzkever. Well, there was no question that I would have wanted to meet Sutzkever because he was a legend. Um, he, he is, you know, the most, if I took his biography, I may mean, say he's the most legendary figure I know because um, I won't go into his whole biography, but let's just say that he had lived through the Vilna ghetto and throughout the ghetto years, he continued to write poetry and um, a Lithuanian partisan leader who came into the ghetto 
took his poems, took them to the Soviet Union, and the um, Jewish anti-fascist committee in the Soviet Union was so impressed, dazzled by this poetry, that when Sutzkever and his wife managed to be in the partisan group that left through the sewers to join the partisans in the woods fighting in 1943, this uh, anti-fascist committee in Moscow sent a special plane near a, a, an informal landing to pick Sutzkever and his wife up and bring them to Moscow. Right? That's, it's not an everyday story. And um, he became a very good friend of Ilya Ehrenberg's. And his, he was the first one who formally, through Pravda, was able to speak about the annihilation of Polish Jewry in the Soviet Union. And then he was chosen to testify on behalf of Soviet Jewry at the Nuremberg trials. And that testimony you can see on YouTube as he stands there at the Nuremberg trials. They tell him to sit, but he won't sit. He stands there and bears witness to what had gone on in the ghetto. So this is the man. Then, because he was from Poland, he was repatriated so he could go back to Poland. From Poland, he went to Paris. From Paris, he managed through the intervention of Golda Meir, who was then still Golda Meyerson, she got him to Palestine in 1947, November of 1947, <laughs> six months or so before the creation of the State of Israel. And then he settles in Tel Aviv, and he, uh, he, he did what some people jokingly say, the greatest miracle that he accomplished of all was that he talked the Histadrut the uh, basically the most powerful uh, Jewish organization, the most powerful organization in pre-state and early state uh, of Israel, he talked them into founding, helping him found a Yiddish quarterly, which he called the golden chain, of, after the golden chain of Jewish tradition. So this is Sutzkever. This is apart from his poetry, you understand. This is just his personality. Was I not going to meet this person? You tell me. Well, of course, I was so thrilled. So I called him up, and of course, he in, uh, invited us. Uh, I write in this memoir that I wrote, uh, this funniest thing, he, we came to meet him, and he says, um, um, you know, what, what, are you, what are you both doing tomorrow night? I said, I don't know. He said, this is good. He said, because we're invited to a wedding. Our good friends are making, their daughter is getting married. They're having a wedding tomorrow night. You must come. Now, we had just gotten married, and you know how hard it is to carve out a list of people to come to your wedding? No, we're not going to invite this one, no. And here's this guy, it's not his wedding, it's a friend's a child's wedding, and he says, you must come to this wedding. So, I mean, really? He insisted. So, of course... We went to the wedding, and we were royally received, and the, we sat beside them, and so on. You know, you just learned that whatever he said got done in the circle of people who knew him. He was, he was quite remarkable. So how did he influence you? Well, that in itself was meaningful. But um, So th this is what happened. When I went back to Montreal, I got a job working at the Canadian Jewish Congress. I knew that Sutzkever wanted to come to North America on a speaking tour. He wasn't allowed into the United States. He couldn't get a visa because they said that he had gotten a Stalin Prize. And those were days when it was, you know, if you were a communist or suspected of being a communist, you were not welcome. So he couldn't Everyone was trying to bring him to the United States on a speaking tour. But here I was working for the Canadian Jewish Congress. So I said, you know, he's going to come on a speaking tour to Canada. So I organized this speaking tour for him in Canada. And he came, and it was just extraordinary. I mean, you can't recreate that. First of all, there was a huge, already, I mean, to me, large Yiddish-speaking population in Montreal. And the poets from the United States who had tried to bring him there 
came to the evening. They came up to Montreal, so the hall was jammed. And there he stood reciting these poems that he had written in the ghetto and that he'd written afterwards, really powerful poems. He, he was a lyric poet, by the way, but of course, under this pressure of history, he had begun to write many poems, which were like national poems, and it's those that he chose to read. So it was very, very stirring. Well, to get to the what it has to do with me, so of course we became very good friends. I ushered him, I, I took him everywhere. So um, I had the benefit of really getting to know him and, and know how he thought and heard all his stories. He loved to tell stories about what had happened. But then, not long before he was leaving, he said to me, well, what are you going to do uh, with, like, the rest of your life? <laughs> and I loved it because, of course, I did not think that I was going to spend the rest of my life working at the Canadian Jewish Congress either. So I said, you know, I'm actually thinking of going back to school to study further. And he said, well, what will you study? I said, I, well, I was studying English literature. I think I'll continue to study English literature. And he said, well, why don't you study Yiddish literature? And I laughed. And I said, and what would I do? Teach Sholem Aleichem? And I've told this story, you know, often. I mean, I tell it against myself, obviously, because, you know, the words had just come out of my mouth. And to say that he was hurt is putting it mildly. She was flabbergasted. What would I do? Teach you? To, well, God. But this was me. You see, I'd been raised on Yiddish literature. I'd studied stories by Sholem Aleichem. How could I think this was preposterous? And here we come to a very interesting, not just about me, but isn't this an interesting cultural question? How did it, uh, it never occur to me that one could teach Yiddish literature at the level that I wanted to teach because I had not seen it done. And so for that split second, you see, it had not occurred to me until it was said. Now, the minute I said those words, it, it changed. And then, of course, he <laughs> was an agent provocateur. He didn't just say that. What are you going to do? Um, he, he knew what he was saying because he knew that in New York, at Columbia University, Someone he knew, Uriel Weinreich, the son of Max Weinreich, whom he knew very well from Vilna, who had been his teacher, they were trying to get students into a new program of Yiddish studies. So when he said, <laughs> why don't you study Yiddish literature? It wasn't just out of the blue. I didn't, I didn't realize any of this, of course. So I said to him, when I calmed down, when the, I said, well, there's no place to study. Yiddish literature. And he said, oh, yes, there is. <laughs> so that leads us to the second figure. So who is Weinreich? So Weinreich, um, you know, one is larger than the other. Weinreich was um, really a great man. Um, but I, the reason that one doesn't know him so well is because he was kind of on the wrong side of history. You know, greatness is defined not just by who you are in your time, but really who you are against the background of your time. Weinreich in Vilna was the founder of the, one of the, but really the founding force behind the YIVO Institute of Jewish Research. And he had, by 1940, he had helped to refound the branch of the YIVO Institute of Jewish Research, which is now in New York. Um, it was an amazing institution. It was founded the same year as the Hebrew University, and it saw itself as a kind of university, really. And he taught there. Uh, he taught Yiddish and linguistics, and um, there were f they taught um, anthropology, they taught sociology, they taught history. Um, but he was in charge of one of the branches. A marvelous man, and also a... Um, a person who understood that everything depended on the next generation. Could you get the youth well-educated? So he actually founded an organization 
like the Boy Scouts, based on the model of the Boy Scouts in Vilna. He was the head master. He had a cadre of leaders under him. And Sutzkever was one of the campers in that thing. So this was Weinreich in Vilna at the head of, get this, I mean, can, can you figure this? This is the person who founds an institute of higher learning. You know, all, all these people there were graduates, PhDs from German universities. So they're all scholars at the highest level, and he was. He was doing scholarship at the highest level. But at the same time, he's running an organization for kids where they swear loyalty to Jewish culture. And he takes them on hikes, and he takes, teaches them the, how to, about the woods and how to... This, this is because the way to our youth... And by the way, he uh, organized a... Um, contest of autobiographies of youth, because he said that the only way we're going to find out who our youth is, is by knowing who they are. So he organized a contest of autobiographies. Eric, anybody who is doing research on Jewry before the war, reads those autobiographies. Not all of them survived, but many of them survived. They are the source for historians, for everybody. So when you say he was on the wrong side of history, what do you mean? So what, that's such a bitter uh, tweet. So in Vilna, he was everything that, that he could be, although there were problems there as well. But then he came to New York and he had put in, you see, for him, Yiddish was not just what it was for my mother. For him, Yiddish was the world. He was a, not a communist. He was against the Soviet Union. But he was also not a Zionist. And so when they were founding, when the Hebrew University finally decided to found a, a department of Yiddish literature, they asked Dov Sadan, who was the greatest Yiddish scholar in Israel at the time, to be the teacher, the professor. But Sadan had never attended a university course. He was an autodidact completely. So Sadan says, you don't want me. You want Max Weinreich, who was then in New York. Nobody there wanted Max Weinreich, but Sadan insisted that he was the greatest. But Max Weinreich didn't take the job. And uh, then when he became my teacher for a semester at, when I did go to study Yiddish literature and Yiddish uh, at Columbia, I had the good fortune to have Max Weinreich as my teacher for one semester, really the best semester of my entire education and uh, the most amazing teacher. But I asked him once, I asked him, why didn't you take the course? Why didn't you take the job in Jerusalem? And he said, I never contributed anything to the building of the country. I couldn't be its beneficiary. Um, now, w was that completely, you know, I'm not going to psychologize here, but there's a refinement to these people that is kind of, I don't know, it's a sort of a moral refinement of a, of a very high level. So the third figure I wanted to ask you about... <laughs> We're really going. <laughs> ...is Saul Bellow, who I'm sure is probably the most well-known of the three. Um, it's this great American Probably to novel. the listening, yes. Um, how did your life and his intersect, and what has he meant to you? Well, that's already a very different uh, story. Weinreich was my teacher, and we stayed close until he died very, very prematurely. Um, Bellow's a different story. You see, we were tied because we're both Montrealers. Now, he's really a Montrealer. He's a native Montrealer. Uh, but I was still living in Montreal, and he was already living in Chicago. But he started, you know, he had family in Montreal to whom he was very close, and so he would very often visit Montreal. And when he came, he would speak at the Jewish Public Library, or he would speak at McGill. So over the years, I saw him quite often and kind of got to know him from a distance. Now, what he most meant to me at first was, when I was writing my dissertation at McGill, um, 
they, I got permission in a program of English literature. They did give me permission to write my PhD on a comparative subject. That's the one. Uh, that, that, that's that's the one favor that the that was your loophole. That was my loophole. They <laughs> granted me, it made me very happy. So I had to devise a subject, and I devised this subject of the Schlemiel as hero in Yiddish and American fiction. That's how it was. And it wasn't a phony subject, because there was this figure of the Schlemiel who fascinated me totally. Um, and I could trace his emergence in Yiddish literature and then show how he becomes a character in American Jewish fiction. So that's what the book, you know, it then turned into a book. That was my thesis. But my thesis advisor was my former professor as an undergraduate at uh, McGill. And this was Louis Dudek, um, who was a Polish Catholic. Um, and, um, and incidentally, when Sutzkever came, I did bring the two men together, and they spoke Polish together about Polish poetry. <laughs> but, but Louis Dudek agreed to be my advisor, but he had not read a single work that I was uh, proposing to uh, write about, with one exception, S Saul Bellow's book, Herzog. That he had read, and he was a great admirer of Bellow's. So in a way, if it hadn't been for Bello, I don't know whether I could have written this dissertation because he was, you know, Dudek knew that this was a great work, so okay, the others must be good too. <laughs> sort of, it was like that. Um, but then, because of the Montreal connection, basically, um, we became friends, and then through a tremendous good fortune, um, we landed up being in Boston at the same time. He came from Chicago to teach at Boston University, and then I had gone to teach at Harvard, and he had married uh, Janice Bellow, who was a Canadian, and a wonderful, wonderful person. So we became friends. And in those last years of his, and our last years, you know, we lived in Cambridge for 20 years, or most of that time, we were really very good friends. What is it that you admired about him? About Bellow. Well, admired personally. As a novelist. As a, yes, well, as a novelist, mostly personally, I would say what we most, what I most loved was that we spoke Yiddish. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a real connection. He spoke Yiddish with his brothers, but his brothers had died by the end of the time that I knew him. So this was a special connection. What I admired about his writing, um, look, um, he had a mission in literature. He wasn't just a writer. He, he saw the novel as being tremendously important because his idea was that, you know, more than at any other time, there was this force of entropy in the world. There was so much information coming from all areas. There were so many possibilities open. People were being pulled away and society was being pulled away in a thousand directions. Through the consciousness of this character, who is always at the center of his novels, and usually a character very much based on Bello himself, it all comes together in a living, very thinking, very thoughtful human being. So what he has is a novel of, it's a very Jewish kind of novel, not because it deals with a Jewish subject and not even because of the style or of that, that it's just conceptually, it seemed the closest thing that I had ever found in literature to who I was and how I thought about the world. Um, this person who just, who doesn't, who doesn't go out there in order to fit into whatever there is, but who somehow or other wants the world to be comprehensible in himself, right? And who makes it comprehensible through his fiction by holding it together in a work of fiction. Now, the, the, it's funny because these characters are all in a state of disarray. <laughs> you know, he, he has characters like Herzog, you know, who's in a terrible situation. Why a Schlemiel? Well, because of the classic situation of the Schlemiel, not just in Yiddish fiction. There is no character in fiction who is as laughable 
as the cuckold. I mean, the men out there will forgive me, but that's just the way theater and everything works. The man who doesn't realize that his wife is sleeping with someone else, you know, is the great ha ha ha, you know, the great uh, foil of comedy. So here is Herzog, whose best friend has been having this affair with his wife while this best friend is still telling him how to run his life. And he never stops being his best friend in a way. And here's this great professor genius Herzog, you know, and all this is happening under his nose and he doesn't even know it. So that's the situation of the character as we find him at the beginning, going a little bit off his rocker because his first sentence of the book is, if I'm out of my mind, it's all right with me, says Boris Herzog. So you see, yes, a little upset um, because it's, you know, the situation is very upsetting. But what a character, what a consciousness, and a tremendous attempt to understand what it is to be a man in that situation, um, what was actually going on as he reconstructs it. How do you remain a father to your child under these circumstances? Do you kill this other guy? <laughs> what do you do with him? You know, how do you live with that humiliation? How do you overcome that humiliation and not let it define you? So that was my character, you see. The Shlemiel to me was the character of the Jew to whom everything happens that is laughable to everyone else. But inside him, he doesn't let it define him, you see. So you spoke earlier about Yiddish language, Yiddish literature, Yiddish culture as the sort of the carrier of Jewish identity in in your in your home growing up, especially for your mother, right? Is there anything like that today in modern America? Meaning, as you look at the the scene of Jewish life today in America, right? Where do you see the carriers of Jewish identity? Oh, well, there are certainly characters of uh, carriers, very strong carriers of Jewish identity, but they're not anything like that anymore. Um, and that's one of the things going back to what I said about Weinreich that was so sad. You see, Weinreich wrote the history of the Yiddish language, which is a great work, by the way, very, very important work, four volumes, two volumes of footnotes, but it's very worthwhile looking into. And for Weinreich, Yiddish was the repository of Jewishness, the repository of Jewishness, and he shows it. He calls Yiddish the language of Derech Hashas, the language of the way of the Talmud, basically. And he shows, he shows you this in a wonderfully accurate way of how, what it means. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful work. But he thought it worked the other way. He thought that Yiddish could also be the carrier of Jewishness. Now, this was a great mistake. Uh, because Yiddish was so rich with Jewishness, and in that first generation of people who had come from Orthodox families or practicing families and were not practicing, like my parents, the Jewishness was so thick, it was so dense, it was in everything. So yes, Yiddish indeed was the carrier of Jewishness, but it didn't work the other way. Teaching Yiddish to people <laughs> did, not, it not, it did not become the language, it did not become the carrier of Jewishness. And, and this is a mistake that some people make, you see. Yiddish is a wonderful language and so on. But in itself, it is not the character of, of Jewishness by any means. As a matter of fact, it can be, and it was in the Soviet Union, the carrier and instrument of anti-Jewishness. So, um, so, so he invested in the language as being that carrier. And um, what can I say? Um, so now look at the world of Jewish life today. And so you look at it today, and it's not that. There are some kids who speak Yiddish at home right. and so forth. But look at modern orthodoxy in, in America, for one thing. In America, I would say that's one of the strongest places to look. 
um, families which are entirely in American, very thickly American. Their language of communication is English, but their homes and their schools and their institutions are richly Jewish. Their way of life is Jewish. They have what I would call that moral confidence of Jews. And they also live, most of them, in physical communities, which is very important. You know, not just Zoom communities, which you can see the strength of that. I mean, thank God it was here recently, but you know that it doesn't translate into a community. So I would say that's one place to look. Um, Look, the Chabad world in uh, the United States of America is a kind of a miraculous phenomenon. There's really one person, uh, Rabbi Schneerson, who is, I mean, I, I mean, what do you say about a person like that? He really imbues an entire uh, community of people um, to understand that they can transform, that they can do anything. That if they go out there and they give somebody Shabbos candles, if that person is a Jew, they can bring that Jew to Judaism. Um, So let me just give you one example, which unfortunately I don't know why I left out of the book, and I wish I could insert it in some way or other in a second edition, maybe I will. But talking about your exactly the question you raise, who are the leaders, what are the things that are admirable about American Jewry, if we're going to speak about this part of the world. Um, So when I was at Harvard one day, a young man came to my door and... um, Hello, yes. He said, um, well, he introduced himself and he said, I am going to build Chabad House here at Harvard. And (laughs) God help me. And I said, why? Because you want to destroy Hillel? And he said, this is my gentle self, you (laughs) see. (laughs) And, And because I was not very close to Chabad before I met uh, Hershey Zarchi. Um, and he said, well, why would I do that? So then I, I realized that I was totally out of line. And I sort of, I, I said, well, I'm sorry. I said, well, what, why do you want to? He said, well, because there are things that Hillel does not do. And was he ever right? And what's so amazing about what Chabad did. I'm not, I'm not trying to pit one against the other. But you see, Hillel thought it had to be everything to everyone. You want a minion of this kind? Okay. You want to have a, a students for justice in Palestine that's sort of anti-Israel? Well, how can we keep you out? I mean, after all, you're Jews and so on. It, it, it didn't know. I didn't know what it was, basically. It had to sort of accommodate. Chabad is so interestingly different. Chabad is the most open place in the world. I mean, you go to a Friday night there and everybody can come and everybody brings their roommates and their friends. Everybody's so easygoing because Chabad is what Chabad is. You can be anything you want, but we know exactly who we are. And this is the way we make Shabbos. And won't you celebrate it with us? If you like it, come again. If you want to learn how to do this, I will teach you. But I am not up for sale. You see, Chabad House is what it is. And it is fully that, richly that. You see, such a different model. So I would say that everything in American Jewish life that is on that model, I know what I am. You come into my house you're so welcome here. Those things work. So you've devoted much of your life to the work of Jewish education, meaning of, of bringing Jewish ideas to young people in general and bringing Jewish ideas to Jews in particular. Much of that was in the university setting, at McGill and then at Harvard. And for the last decade, it's been here, teaching at Tikva. So how do you think about these different models of trying to educate young Jews 
you know, the Jewish studies model, the university model on the one hand, and the Tikva model that you've helped shape and participate in for the last many years? Well, it's, it's a question I've asked myself, and I find it really hard to answer uh, as crisply as one might like. Um, but here's the difference. You see, when, when we started to teach Jewish studies, when I started to teach Jewish literature at McGill, I would never have thought that there was any, uh, that there could be any problem because I knew what I was doing. I, I wanted to be as good a teacher of this material as I could possibly be to everyone, right? And to teach some of it in Yiddish, which would require greater immersion and the thing. But the university at that time was a place that was so neutral uh, that you could bring your own product into it and you could teach it within your own framework and it would be respected and you understood that it was a continuum with other subjects. And when there was crossover, then it was very delightful because you could give a course, let's say, on American Jewish literature, which would include both Yiddish and, he and, uh, and Hebrew and but mostly in English and things subjects. And there were students who were interested from American studies who came to it. So the, the, the university itself was a different place at that point. And I, I did not see problems at that time, but they crept up during the time that I was there um, because the university lost confidence basically during the years that I was in it, lost confidence in what it was. Uh, a university has to be a place of authority. There has to be a place where you have to know where professors, they don't have to pretend to more knowledge than they have, but they have to be authorities in their field. They have to have a command and they have to believe that there is something valid and important about what it is that they're teaching. I never doubted that the person who learned works of Yiddish literature and understood how the Jews worked in modern history and so forth could be anything but better for knowing this, for being enlarged by it, you see. I believed in it, and everybody I knew believed in the subjects that they taught. And then really came um, this um, antagonism, this idea that Western civilization was wrong that Western civilization was imposed on others, and that everything about what we were doing was um, uh, was just, um, you, you know, that authority was bad. Um, and this negativity, uh, I mean, it, it just ate up the university in a way. It, it began to destroy it with all kinds of other forces. Um, you know, the, when I came to Harvard, um, that was really a time when, that was a moment when the change had already happened by 1993, but I wasn't aware of it because Canada was a little bit behind. But when I came to uh, Harvard, the thing that hit me most was that the faculty was kind of, had, had a f fanatical opposition to the reserve officer training program. That's the reserve officer training program. Now, my older brother had been a cadet when he was, you know, everybody used to be in the reserve officer training program if you were an upstanding young man or in those days, young men, right? Um, but here, the faculty had insisted that there be no reserve officer training program on campus. And they held on to that position for 40 years, using one excuse after another. Then the excuse became because there were, because the army had a policy of don't ask, don't tell, right? Um, and, and it didn't let homosexuals openly come into the service. That became the excuse for not having reserve officer training program. Well, I could see fighting the policy but not to train for the military because you didn't. So you see, you, this may be a small thing to you, but to me, this was the most symptomatic thing that I saw. The, the years when you were a soldier, 
coincide with the years of being an undergraduate. You know, I would say sometimes to people, look, I would love to fight for my country, but I can't. You don't want a woman of 85, you know, coming to fight for your country. Like it or not. I might want you. <laughs> yes, well, I don't think I, I you know. So, so you see how that in itself is, I think, you know, it tells you of the lack of confidence. But how did that shape Jewish studies and what you felt you could accomplish as an educator of Jewish ideas? And then how do you see the last decade or so at Tikva as a different model? Okay, I, I went a little bit off, off uh, course there in, in, You're in telling. Yes, I'm allowed. Thank you. <laughs> I just have to pour out my heart. When am I going to have a chance to do this, this again? Is, you just want to join ROTC, that's all. <laughs> well, I fought for ROTC on campus <laughs> as much as I possibly could. Um, what happened to Jewish studies? Well, it's the same lack of confidence, basically, but in another arena. Um, it's oddly enough now, what has happened to Jewish studies is the same thing that happened in the rest of the academy. It became an adversarial culture. And what people like to do now, even in, in Jewish studies, is to teach against the grain. Against the grain. So um, do you want to, I mean, why would one want to teach a subject against the grain? It's against, I can't understand it. Uh, frankly, I mean, I can see it as a, you know, as it's something to do at the end of a course, you know, to sort of twist it a little bit. But what you try to do is to get at the gist of something. You're teaching Jewish studies because of the importance of Jewish experience, the importance of the subjects. This is not the way it's taught now. It is now taught, how can you, if you, is there a feminist? Oh, how can we take this how, what can we find in Yiddish literature and Jewish studies that fits the feminist model? Oh, is there now an anti uh, sort of, is there, I don't know, what uh, an intersectionality of this particular level? Is there a homosexual aspect to it? Oh, there is an aspect. Let's go for queer studies and Jewish studies. Let's look, let's mine it for this aberration. Let's mine it for this negativity. Let's mine it for this uh, oddity or whatever. Instead of, just the meat and potatoes instead of just what Judaism is. Now, so what's happening in Jewish studies is not at all different from what is happening in the rest of the academy, but it's, it's very painful to those of us who tried to build Jewish studies on a certain model. Um, and, um, and if you look at the Association for Jewish Studies, do you know there were, I mean, all right, it's a small percentage. It's not more than 10%, let's say, of the people in Jewish studies. But at least 10% of the professors in Jewish studies, when, when, when President Trump moved the embassy to Jerusalem, they signed a statement against it. What is, what is that? What is it? It's a kind of an insanity. I mean, first of all, who cares what you think about this if you're, if you're against it or what? And you didn't sign anything that had to do with, you know, the f fight against, uh, you know, what was happening in Israel, the wars or anything. There were no statements of that kind, nothing pro-Jewish that was ever stated. So no. what's the positive alternative? If you care about the transmission of Jewish ideas, Jewish culture. This brings us home to Tikva. So I think that one of the inspiring things that has happened in American Jewish life happens to be this thing with which I am proud to be associated. And that is that there is a recognition that um, much has to be learned and taught. And um, Tikva is not only about Jewish studies, although however it's invested in building the Jew and Jewish conservatism, since it is here in America, I find it also to be a very American affirming uh, way of learning. Uh, it's not accidental that some of the courses have to do with um, Hebraism in America, the Hebrew roots of America. It's not accidental that courses are given, you know, that try to show you the combination of Western thought, the best in Western thought and the best in Jewish thought, and to see in which ways they connect 
and in which ways they diverge and how the two things have to be together because they're together in us. How does it work? It is such a creative, exploratory, I would say it makes me feel healthy. It just makes me feel intellectually alive, but also spiritually healthy. And I'm surrounded by people whom I, I just feel that they're kind of, this is the way people should be. They like who they are. They want to find out more about it. And because they love their subject, of course, they look to teach others. Why don't, in the same way that you say, let the Chabad would say, why don't you come and have a dinner with us? Well, one offers one's courses in exactly the same way. Why don't you come read Mosaic every day and see what we have to offer? Why don't you come and read the Jewish Review of Books? Why don't you come and sign up for a class and send your children to sign up for these classes? Because it's so enriching and it's so exciting. It, it sounds ridiculous to say <laughs> that one wants a positive... <laughs> One wants a positive relationship to the things that one learns. Does one even have to say those words? It seems yes. So I want to close by asking you about the title of your memoir. <laughs> Free as a Jew. What's the meaning of this title? Well, <laughs> good. If you're asking me the question, I'm sure it will be asked, and I will never have a good answer for it, I think. Well, this could at least be a good, good first round here. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I'll tell you, I think that at this moment in time, the word Jew is very unpopular. Um, I think that um, people try to skirt around the Jewishness, they don't, and we can bring many examples of people wanting uh, not to wear it proudly because we've been put on the defensive, because Israel's been put on the defensive and we're moving on the defensive, it seems to me, much too uh, accommodatingly. Well, that's not me. And so partly I wanted the word Jew in the title because it's not all that the book is, but it's a very large part of it. Free as a Jew because... Freedom is an ultimate value to me, maybe too important. I love freedom. I mean, I, I, I just, it's very important to me to think freely and to feel free. Um, I found what mask wearing, all these things. I'm not a libertarian politically, but uh, I'm not surprised that, you know, when one of my children is very close to <laughs> calling herself a libertarian because, um, you know, that, I, that idea of freedom is really so important. Free as a Jew means a couple of things. It means free in the way that Jews are free, free to be responsible. It's, in other words, the quality of freedom that I'm looking for is freedom as it's defined in Judaism, which is not freedom from, but freedom to, to take on responsibilities. So that's one of the main things that I mean by that. And it has a subtitle. It's a personal memoir of national self-liberation. So I happen to have been alive during this remarkable period when the Jewish nation was reestablished. So it is my personal route to that kind of freedom, you know, that I am telling the story of how national freedom was won, and it would be so wonderful to really just have it live full-throatedly. And, um, you know, and I'm, I, I admire it so much, what the Jews have been able to do. I wish others could be brought to do so as well. Well, Ruth, for opening up with us tonight for the writing, the speaking, the teaching, uh, educating so many people in so many ways all these years over Tikva. We thank you. Thank you, Eric.